Good afternoon. On behalf of the Ford School of Public Policy, and in particular, the International Policy Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our sixth webinar event for the North American Colloquium on Climate Policy Series. The North American Colloquium uh, is an ongoing collaboration between the Ford School, the University of Toronto's Monk School, and the Centro de Investigaciones sobre América del Norte at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. I would also like to acknowledge the generous uh, support of the Meany Family Foundation for making this year's programming possible. Today's event focuses on public opinion on climate and energy issues in the three North American countries. First, we'll hear from Chris Boric and Eric LaChapelle, who will present new data from their ongoing twin energy and environment surveys in the United States and Canada. Then we'll hear from Itzhuatli Samora Sanz, a researcher at the Dominguez Belisario Institute of the Mexican Senate, who will give us a sense of where the Mexican public is on climate and energy matters. As audience members, you can ask a question in writing using the Q&A feature on your Zoom control panel. During the Q&A, we'll get to as many of your questions as possible, but apologies that we will not be able to get to all of them. We may go about 15 minutes beyond the scheduled end time of 1 p.m. local time to accommodate as many questions as possible. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Barry Rabe, who is the J. Ira and Nikki Harris Family Professor of Public Policy and the Arthur Thurnau Professor of Environmental Policy here at the Ford School to introduce Drs. Boric and LaChapelle. Barry? Thank you, Josh, uh, for the introduction. And I also just want to thank you for your stewardship of this entire colloquium project. It's just been terrific to have all of this important work uh, under your leadership. So thank you. Um, I'm very excited about the chance today to do something that is done relatively rarely in environmental policy. And that is to work across national boundaries, but think about questions related to public public views, public opinion. I wanna thank all three of our distinguished visitors today and wanna to say that I'm very much looking forward to their role, their, their, their contributions and thoughts on all of this. And I also want to acknowledge that I will be, as Josh mentioned, introducing our first two speakers because uh, their work is a formally joined type of a partnership involving a look at public opinion on some of these various issues in the United States, but also Canada, presenting some very recent work, but also some prior work that they have done. Our speakers for this portion of the program, Chris Boric and Eric LaChapelle, are two thought leaders at the intersection of political science, environmental and climate policy, and public opinion in the United States and Canada, and have also done some just wonderful work bringing their, their thoughts and efforts together on this. I've known both of them for a long time. They're good friends and, and colleagues. Uh, we've collaborated in a number of, of areas. And so it's always a treat for me to actually welcome them back to Weill Hall. This is a, a virtual visit there. They've been in the, the friendly confines of Weill um, before. Uh, Chris is a professor of political science at Muhlenberg College, where he directs the Muhlenberg Institute of Public Opinion and for many years has been the director of the National Surveys on Energy Environment, a remarkable uh, ongoing survey project uh, with heavy input from Muhlenberg students and actually some prior former involvement in partnership with the Ford School that I'm very grateful for that really has looked closely at many of these issues in an American context. Eric LaChapelle is on the faculty at the University of Toronto Political Science Department has published widely in issues of political economy, environmental politics, and policy. And in recent years, uh, Eric has been the director of the Canadian surveys of energy and environment. These are not formally merged and joined, but collaborate, uh, engage, try to ask similar questions. And so it's a real treat for me to welcome them back and, and, and say that I'm looking forward to their report. My understanding is, Chris, that you're going to go first followed by, by Eric. So welcome to you both and thanks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Barry, for the very warm invite. And it's great to be back uh, at Michigan, if, if only in virtual form. I'd love to be at the corner of State and Hill uh, and doing this in the, the Betty Ford Auditorium and, and seeing people face to face. But it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for Eric and I to, to, to join you. Josh, thank you so much for organizing this, putting all the logistics together and, and the whole series has been wonderful. And it's, it's an honor for us 
uh, to, to be part of it. And as, as Barry said, we've had a, an ongoing relationship, the National Surveys on Energy and Environment and the Canadian counterpart that Eric has, has stewarded for years are largely originated with, uh, with folks in Michigan, Barry as, as a, a leader uh, in putting this together over a decade ago now, now well over a decade ago, uh, but our affiliation with, with the Ford School and the Close Up Center, uh, which Barry formerly directed is a wonderful, wonderful resource with outstanding scholars and, and researchers. Uh, so it's, it's really a bit of coming home today to, uh, to, our, to work with our friends at, at Michigan. So with that, we're going to take you through a little bit of a journey uh, through our research on Canadian and American views um, on climate matters, broadly defined. Uh, and Eric is actually going to lead us off uh, today. We, we decided Canada first uh, in, in the order uh, and then to the United States. And as you can see, Eric is, is getting the, uh, our slides booted up. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric to take us to Canada, and then we'll cross the border back to the United States before heading south to Mexico. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks, uh, Josh and Barry for the invitation. And uh, it's great to be here. Happy spring, everyone. Um, I guess we're going north to south uh, today. So we'll start off in Canada. Um, and by the way, I am at the Université de Montréal. As much as I'd love to be uh, at the, in Toronto, I'm from Toronto. Um, just wanted to make that uh, clear. Uh, so uh, as, as Chris mentioned, just a very high level perspective, kind of the view from 20,000 feet. We'll start with the Canadian perspective, then jump to the United States. And if time allows, we'll do some comparative perspective. We would have loved to present kind of um, a comparative poll, uh, including Mexico, but that will be for another time. Uh, so I'll be speaking today, drawing mostly on the Canadian surveys on energy and the environment. So this is a data set that goes back to 2011. Uh, so quite a few uh, observations. We have an N of 11,738. These are based uh, using the same methodology as uh, the American uh, the, American surveys that Chris will be talking about. So these are random digit dialing telephone surveys, very high quality representative samples of the Canadian population. But I, I will also be drawing on uh, just towards the end of my presentation on a 2019 post-election survey that we did here in Canada. Uh, this was administered online by Leger uh, and it has an end of about 2,500. And just some highlights of, of what I'll be speaking today um, first is that there's uh, considerable evidence of polarization in Canadian attitudes towards climate change. And I think that's an important, something important to kind of tease apart and look at uh, because we're, we're, there's a lot of research coming out of the United States and a lot has been documented on uh, polarization in that country. It's an open question of just how polarized publics are in other parts of the world. So this is kind of a an, an exciting uh, avenue of research and a way to present the Canadian data that I hope folks will appreciate. Secondly, I will look uh, specifically at some contentious policy issues uh, related to climate change in Canada, uh, notably carbon taxes, pipelines, and nuclear energy. And thirdly, uh, I'll just look at, uh, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of speculation in Canada that um, environmental and in particular climate, the climate change issue is politically important. Uh, there was speculation that uh, it was one of the most defining issues in the 2019 federal election. So we'll, we'll be looking a little bit about uh, a little bit at the issue voting in the 2019 federal election. So to begin, um, this is kind of the, the high level uh, primary belief question that we use in Canada and the United States. It's um, question wording, is there a solid evidence that the average temperature on earth has been getting warmer the past four decades? So it's really looking at the temperature trend or the perceptions of a temperature trend. Uh, overall, if you look at the black line at the top, that's the overall average in Canada, which has tended to be fairly consistent, uh, at least relative to what you'll see in the American data set. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, an increase in from about 80% uh, of, uh, of population that believes uh, there's solid evidence of climate change to uh, close to 90% in 2018, falling off a little bit uh, in the mid 80s uh, since then. The red line looks at the, sub, the perceptions of Liberal Party of Canada supporters. And you'll see here that um, 
it's been fluctuating a little bit around the 90% level. Uh, the green line is not the Green Party of Canada, it's actually the NDP. Uh, and the NDP actually reached 97% of supporters of the NDP believe that there's solid evidence of, of climate change. So um, very, very, a lot of, of support for the idea uh, that climate change is happening and temperatures are, are warming. If you look at the blue line just below, uh, that's the Conservative Party of Canada supporters. And we see that between 2011 and 2018, if you just kind of slice the, if you put your finger at 2018, you'll see that there's a general increase in the uh, percentage of Conservative Party of Canada supporters who uh, acknowledge warming temperatures uh, from a low, from the low 60s in 2018 to the high 70s in 2018. But then, uh, and, and I should say that this tracks very closely American opinion over the same time period. So in other words, a Conservative Party of Canada supporters in, during this period, 2011 to 2018, were more similar to the average American than to the average Canadian. Uh, second thing to point out here is that uh, since 2018, though, you see that the gap seems to be widening between, for instance, uh, Con uh, Conservative Party of Canada supporters and NDP and the Liberal Party of Canada supporters. And we might speculate uh, that uh, 2018 was when um, the carbon, the Trudeau carbon tax became uh, a reality, was becoming discussed and began to be implemented. And um, there's that notion of solution aversion, right? People deny problems that exist because they don't like the solutions that are proposed for them. So that's a bit of speculation there, but there is something going on here since about 2018. If we look at the bottom of the chart, these are the percentage of the population that say, no, there's no solid evidence of uh, warming temperatures. And we see that the, uh, there are very few, relatively few, uh, about 10%, 15%, of the population sees no solid evidence, but up to 30% of Conservative Party of Canada supporters. And you might have seen in the news last week that the Conservative Party of Canada delegates uh, voted uh, against a proposal put forth by some delegates to recognize the reality of climate change, uh, that their party recognized the reality of climate change. But these, these data suggest that while there are a considerable, about a third of Conservative Party of Canada supporters who deny climate change, a majority nevertheless um, believes climate change is real. And so those Conservative Party delegates are out of step with their voting base. Uh, the next few slides are gonna kind of rehash some of the same things, but what we see here is the attribution to human cause. So uh, is the earth getting warmer mostly because of human activities such as burning fossil fuels or mostly because of natural patterns in the earth's environment? We see again, a trend, an upward trend, a more, uh, a more marked upward trend uh, over between 2011 and 2020, um, with the average uh, in, in 2011 at 43%, uh, the black line representing the national average, up to 66% of believers who uh, attribute uh, warming, uh, the earth warming to human activity. So these are, are, are pretty large double digit increases uh, over time. Uh, looking specifically at the Liberal Party of Canada, we're seeing an increase of 48% to 78%, that's a 30% increase in, in about a decade. Um, you also see that the Liberal Conservative gap is widening and in, is in particularly wide on this question. And so in 2011, it was about 21% between Liberal Party of Canada supporters and Conservative Party of Canada supporters. And in 2020, this gap doubled to 40%. So when I, when I kind of foreshadowed the polar evidence of polarization, this is what I'm talking about. Um, and finally, uh, just on the timing question, so when do you think climate change will start to harm people living in Canada? Here we're plotting the percentage of the population or subgroups that believe climate change is already harming people in Canada right here and right now. And you're, you, you see a, a pretty remarkable shift in, from 2014 to 2017 uh, in 2014, about 35% of the population said climate change was harming Canadians here and now. And in 2017, that jumped up to 55%. So that's a very short amount of time to jump so high. Since then, it's plateaued. But this is very much, I think, a product of the impacts of climate change that we've been seeing in that time period. The, the, the forest fires uh, in, in the West and the flooding in the East, which is really bringing the effects of climate change close to home for a lot of Canadians. Uh, again, though, we do note that the uh, Conservative Party of Canada is significantly and substantively much lower in the probability of um, 
saying that climate change is already harming Canada. And that gap, again, widens if we compare the, the size of the gap between 2014 and the size of the gap in 2020. The gap is much larger uh, in more recent years. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about policy support. So this slide goes over uh, some public opinion on a variety of proposals that are discussed in Canada. These data come from some work I did in the fall of 2020 with Echo Analytics. So it's the most recent data I have. Uh, nuclear is at the top. I hope you can all see it. Uh, increasing the amount of electricity produced by nuclear power is the specific item. Uh, and here you see that it's highly polarized with about a quarter uh, who strongly support increasing the amount of nuclear energy uh, and a quarter who strongly oppose increasing the amount of nuclear energy. That leaves 50 that leaves 50 percent of the population nevertheless in the mushy middle or in the don't know category. So there's quite a bit of, 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 of the population that has ambiguous views, but nevertheless those 20 those a quarter of the population is either couched at the extreme end of the support or uh, opposed spectrum. Now, support tends to be concentrated among men, English speakers, supporters of the Conservative Party of Canada, highly educated and wealthy Canadians. In fact, English speakers are twice as likely at 60% to support uh, nuclear energy relative to French speakers at 30%. And the largest support we find is regionally in Alberta at close to 70% support for increasing the amount of nuclear energy. Um, carbon tax is just below. And carbon, a carbon tax is even more polarizing than nuclear energy. As you can see, we're now we're up to about a third of the, of the population that either strongly apport, opposes or strongly supports a carbon tax. And so that, this is evidence of increased polarization because you have more people at the extremes. Now, this is not surprising because this is an issue that is heavily debated in, Ca in Canadian politics. Uh, with carbon price debates uh, featuring prominently in partisan communication and election campaigns, both at the federal level and also at the provincial level. And, that's, and the carbon tax has been used by a political wedge by uh, various politicians in Canada over the years. I'll dig into some of the details of the carbon tax in, in a subsequent slide. The next is, is pipelines at the, in the third row, as you see. Uh, pipelines are also very controversial in Canada, a plurality indicating they strongly support cancelling uh, plans to build new pipelines across the country, but also a non-trivial uh, segment that strongly supports pipelines. Um, this kind of public sentiment may be another factor that could explain the puzzle addressed a few weeks ago by Daniel Bellin and André Lecour, who presented in this colloquium series regarding why pipelines are more politically contentious in Canadian federalism. And finally, I just wanted to draw your attention towards the, the last row where we're looking at nature-based solutions. There's a lot of talk of nature-based solutions uh, across the world and in Canada. In 2020, we found overwhelming support, at least in principle, for nature-based solutions as a means of addressing climate change. To be sure, nature-based solutions are, um, uh, are, are gaining traction. Uh, here we see that uh, uh, of all the policy proposals, uh, nature-based solutions get the most support. Uh, support is highest among women and those on the political left, but it's important to note as well that a majority in every demographic category indicates strong support for this policy option. And I've done some analysis showing that uh, in particular, uh, the, the hard to reach population, at least in terms of climate change, uh, public opinion, the conservative middle-aged white, uh, middle white men uh, are, are in particular um, uh, support nature-based solutions over and above green technology. So there's, there's I'm speculating here, but there might be some room here as, as uh, for nature-based solutions as a potential bridge or an opportunity to grow the coalition, uh, the pro-climate action coalition in Canada. How am I doing for time? Do I need to speed up, Josh? Or uh, maybe I'll just uh, really quickly go over hey, the card. A, a few more minutes is fine. So this is, a, this is looking at net support for a carbon tax. So we, we subtract, oppose. It's the difference between support and opposition. Uh, that's why you see some negative numbers. Negative numbers indicate more opposition than support. Positive numbers indicate more support than opposition. You can see the black line is, again, the national average. So a very divisive, at least in the initial years, 2011, 2013, 2014. We're looking at 50-50 splits. But a net support increases over time. Uh, as Trudeau is implementing this carbon tax, it's particularly high amongst liberal and uh, liberal and NDP voters. But look at what's happening with the Conservative Party of Canada voters. Like just 
plummeting over time, right? Uh, and you might ask why uh, this, what's driving this polarization? Uh, this comes from a survey I did, I think in 2019, where I, I'm looking at the interaction between uh, how much people say they've heard about the federal carbon pricing plan and how much they uh, support or, or the probability that they support. And you see that the more liberals in the red line, the more uh, a liberal party of Canada supporter has heard uh, of, the, of the climate change plan, the more likely they are to support uh, almost uh, you know, at, at a 90% probability. Whereas the more um, a conservative party of Canada supporter has heard about uh, the carbon pricing plan, the more, uh, the less likely they are to support, like a 20% probability. And what's funny is, uh, if you look at those who report having heard nothing at all about this policy, the opinions are much more similar at when, when, when at, at low levels of knowledge, but at high levels of knowledge, that's what's contributing to polarization. And um, it doesn't take, uh, I, I, I don't think it takes a, an in-depth media analysis to, 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 to document the partisan communication environment, which is, which is you know, the conservatives are very much attacking uh, carbon pricing while the, while the liberals are uh, very much um, supporting. Uh, which leads me to the 2019 federal election. Lots of speculation. You can see here, this is the most important problem question uh, over time. So the 2017, 2018, 2019, concern for healthcare was going down or, or the, the probability of, of, of mentioning healthcare as the most important problem was decreasing. The economy was decreasing, jobs and un unemployment was decreasing, but environment and pollution, and in particular climate change, was increasing. Uh, and so climate change was a very salient issue going into the 2019 federal election, with uh, political parties staking clearly different positions. Uh, Trudeau, with his uh, approach, uh, I'll talk about this in the next slide. One way of looking at climate policy coalitions or climate policy politics in Canada is to look at the two most contentious issues, taxes and pipelines. And so I have a two by two table here where uh, you have some people like the Liberal Party of Canada, Justin Trudeau, you might call this, uh, this is a bit tongue in cheek, but have your cake and eat it too. We want, uh, we want to have a carbon tax. We were serious about reducing carbon, but we also want to build pipelines. Uh, so this is the pro-tax, pro-pipeline coalition. And uh, if we remove the don't knows, that's about 30% of the, the sample, at least uh, in 2019, that um, supported the, the, the Trudeau position. Uh, compare this to the uh, uh, Andrew Scheer position of kind of pro-fossil, uh, anti-tax, uh, but pro-pipeline. About 17% of the population supported this position. Um, then you have the kind of the more consistent environmentalist position, which is pro-tax, anti-pipeline. That represents about 19% of the population. And then I didn't know what to call the anti-tax, anti-pipeline. So there's that CAVE acronym, Citizens Against Virtually Everything. Or it might actually be the anti-tax environmentalists who um, don't support a carbon tax for a variety of reasons and are against the pipeline. But that's, 20, that's not an insignificant percentage of the population at 25%. I really like looking at, at Canadian politics or, or climate politics in this way. Uh, and it really helps to kind of unpack what was the role of uh, carbon taxes and pipelines in the last election. Um, here I'm just looking at uh, one's position on the carbon tax related to their probability of voting for the Liberal Party of Canada. Remember, uh, not too long ago, uh, it, it was popular in Canada to talk about carbon taxes as the third rail of Canadian politics, touch it and die. Trudeau comes in, um, uh, implements his carbon tax, and what we see is he did not lose electorally because of this. Rather, uh, increased support for a carbon tax goes along with an increased probability of voting liberal. And this is my last slide, pipeline politics. Uh, some might say Trudeau took on a real gamble, uh, kind of going right in the middle. Uh, I talked about polarization. I talked about a quarter of the population supporting pipelines, a quarter of the population opposing pipelines, but then that mushy middle is really where Trudeau kind of went in. And we see that uh, actually uh, this, this gamble kind of paid off because uh, people who support pipelines also voted for the, also had an increased probability of voting liberal. And I'll hand it over to, uh, happy to answer questions about this and I'll hand it over to Chris, thanks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Eric, and for, for putting all that in such a, uh, so much in such a quick space. It was, it was impressive. Um, I'm going to, uh, Eric, if you want to drop your um, share, 
I'll I'll jump into mine, and that way I won't have to uh, ask you to move them along. Excellent. Thank you so much. And let's hopefully. Do that. Let's excuse the tech stuff. I think All right, can... everybody see? Yep. That works, Josh? I, I think you're good, yep. All right, sorry about the little transition there, a little bit easier than me saying, Eric, to keep moving slides forward. Uh, so yes, we turn to the, uh, the view from the United States. Um, and uh, as Eric mentioned, we have lots of comparable points, comparable framing of questions over well over a decade now, which is which is great. Um, and so I'm going to use the data that I'm going to report today is, is primarily uh, from the NSEE, uh, National Surveys on Energy and the Environment. And this was established by Michigan and Muhlenberg well over a decade ago now, uh, 13 years uh, in 2008. And it's uh, two national surveys in the United States, probability based surveys, uh, phone methodology, largely cell phone now. Uh, that's we've kind of been over the arc over our history of moving from from landlines to to cell phones uh, and this is a great example of uh, of that um, the partnership between uh, UM and uh, and Muhlenberg uh, lasted between 2008 and 2019 for the last few years it's been exclusively out of out of Muhlenberg but lots of our data uh, and lots of our work it has a deep Michigan tie to it including I just want to make this point uh, available all our data uh, uh, over time with, with a little bit of a lag uh, over the last few years is uh, stored at the ICPSR at Michigan. So it's available publicly. Uh, we rotate in after um, you know, a little bit of time in our own hands uh, for public use. So please, uh, if you're interested in the data sets, um, have at them, lots of great resources there. And as, as I didn't put up a number like Eric did, but we have well over 22,000 surveys uh, over this period, individual surveys, and they're big uh, in-depth surveys too. So lots of rich data that is available for the public. Um, today, it's my pleasure, and it's very exciting, uh, to re release publicly for the first time uh, results from our February fielding, our most re recent wave of the NSEE. And so it's great. I was holding off um, kind of having any, any public thing so we could share it at, at this event. Uh, we will be releasing more substantive reports in the, in the upcoming weeks. I'll be happy to share those uh, with folks uh, on the, on the um, webinar today. So I'm gonna start like Eric did with kind of the big takeaway questions. Acceptance, do you think climate change, there's evidence of it? And this is our time series back to the fall of 2008 and down to the winter of 2021 on that same key question framed exactly as Eric said, do you think there's solid evidence of uh, rising temperatures over the last four decades? And you can see a couple of things, I think, from a quick glance, even a cursory observation. Uh, during the early stages of our surveys, there was movement, uh, some steep declines in acceptance. Uh, about 10 years ago in the spring of 2010, fall of 2010, fall of 20, uh, 2009, uh, and then uh, starting about middle of the last decade, some consistency uh, in terms of public acceptance and stability might be the word that I would use uh, to describe that. Uh, since uh, the fall of 2015, only once have we seen the percentage of Americans that say that there is solid evidence of climate change drop below 70%, and that was in the spring of 2016. Since then, we've seen it consistently be over 70. And the last two iterations of the survey, the summer of 2020 and the winter of 2021, we saw record high levels, 75% of Americans, that's a nice easy three quarters to say, uh, that think there is solid evidence that climate change is happening. And, and that's uh, our, our record levels. Um, we didn't surpass our record level that we established in the first iteration back in 2008, all the way until uh, till 2018. So there's been uh, an early turbulence and stability. Just a couple of things about the turbulence, well studied within the political science literature, the public opinion literature of what happened. People ask what happened to drive those numbers down 20 points in a few years. Uh, the, the evidence points to a confluence of factors. Uh, the uh, elite cues being put out while the United States tried uh, to uh, put policies forth at a federal level during that time with Waxman Markey and other bills uh, drew a big response from uh, the fossil fuel industries, Republicans uh, queuing skepticism about 
uh, climate change. There was economic factors. A number of studies have pointed to the recession as having an effect. Others point uh, to um, some climate variability, weather during those periods. Uh, but important to note, and this is to me a key factor uh, in terms of policymaking, is while acceptance of climate change isn't a sufficient condition to move legislators, it's certainly, I think, necessary at the bottom to have that there. And, and that stability that I mentioned over this period is, is important. Um, of course, accepting the evidence of climate change is one uh, important factor. The cause is equally uh, important. Uh, do you think it's human cause or you think it's natural cause? Uh, and this is a little bit of a busy graph and I'll just give a few points. Uh, the green line is the percentage of people that think climate change is happening that attribute it to anthropogenic factors, human activity. And we've seen that from our first iteration back in the fall 2008, when it was in the mid thirties, rise to now uh, to become a majority of those that accept evidence of climate change say that it is human induced. Uh, an additional, uh, this is the combination, the dark blue line, an additional um, about quarter of Americans that think climate change is happening say at least partially anthropogenic. So the dark blue and the green lines are some degree of anthropogenic cause, which of course, if you're thinking about policy is, is a, a big connection. Uh, do note, and this is an interesting group, Barry and I have, have over the years really been interested in the those that think it's happening, but it's a natural pattern. Very different views often uh, align more with skeptics on some matters than they do those that accept climate change. So it's a group that I, that, that I think is, is worthy of more research, more attention uh, over time because they kind of are in this, this Eric used the mushy middle. I don't know if I'm gonna use mushy middle again, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out there. A um, Couple of more uh, factors. This is um, the, uh, a chart that looks at the causes when you take everybody in total, skeptics and acceptors uh, over, over the time. And so the dark purple are those that think climate change is caused by human activity up here, 38% in our latest iteration, 19% uh, uh, a combination, uh, and 16% uh, think that it's, it's a natural pattern and the rest are either not sure or don't think it's happening. You can see as the sum of all Americans, the share uh, of gray and teal, I guess, the light blue has decreased over time, um, the skeptics, while the percentage of Americans that think it's happening has increased. And you also see the very important darkening, that very dark purple, right? And the mid purple, those that think it's, it's anthropogenic rising as a share of the entire population. So these are signs of, of Americans moving over the last decade to a more um, accepting position. Uh, one really important point, that I think is, is crucial uh, in the policy debate and in the overall um, uh, understanding of where America's at is their confidence in their appraisal. How confident are they that, uh, that what they think is happening is actually happening? So they don't just say, yeah, I think there's evidence. How confident are they? And you can see this chart I think is very important. So over time, there were smaller portions of Americans that actually accepted the evidence of climate change. And among that, uh, that group, the confidence levels were less uh, strong. They weren't as, as clear. What's really important is if you look in this stage, kind of post spring 15, uh, that I, I talked about this durabil uh, durability, stability uh, happening, not only are Americans, more Americans saying they think there's evidence, now record highs, but their confidence level in the appraisal is actually higher also. So you're seeing a confluence, right, of acceptance and confidence, which I think uh, speaks to the durability of, of uh, climate opinions. We Back when Barry and I started the survey in 2008, our first round, you know, this was Obama's running for president, we hit 70%. We think, well, maybe that's, you know, going to hold up. Two years later, it's down to 50%. Uh, some of those factors that I talked about changing that. I think it's a much harder place right now, a more solid position and more difficult to change opinion than it was 10 years ago with things like cues, uh, even economic issues that we've seen over the last year, not moving the dial. So it's, it's an interesting to think about the dur durability of opinions. Um, this is when you kind of put them all together. Uh, uh, people, we ask skeptics how confident they are in their appraisal that it's not happening uh, and look at it uh, comparatively. And you can see 51% 
of Americans, this is the entire population, 51% now think that they it's happening and they're very confident that it's happening. Even back in 2008, uh, well, I don't have it on the slide. Uh, back in 2010, go back a decade, it was only 32%. Uh, smaller number of Americans uh, accept it and, and the confidence levels were there. So we, we've kind of moved to a different spot. I wanna, I wanna finish up with a, a few slides before we, we head to the discussion on, on Mexico. Um, we asked this, this is a question we've asked every time and I, I just wanted to give it from our, our recent most recent wave. Eric talked about in Canada, uh, people saying they've experienced it more, it's happening already there. This is, we ask a question, do you, have you personally felt the effects of climate change? And as you can see in this, a uh, majority of Americans say they have, they either strongly agree or somewhat agree with that. Uh, having a majority of Americans, and we've traced this over time, this is at a record high level, a uh, majority saying that they're actually feeling it uh, is I think a tangible piece of evidence about the durability that I'm talking about. People say they're not only thinking about it, they're experiencing it. Um, interesting question we asked uh, in this round that I thought would be uh, good, good to share. Uh, NASA has reported that 2020 was tied with 2016 as the hottest year on the planet since we started keeping records in 1880. And so we, we wanted to see how people responded to that. How do they look when they see uh, a report from NASA about records uh, being set? Um, and so we gave them their options and you can see here uh, 47, almost half of, of uh, adult Americans said the record heat that NASA reported is evidence that global warming is happening and it's caused by humans. Not, not surprisingly about a quarter given where, where our numbers say is that the record heat uh, is happening but it's more of a natural cycle, a kind of interesting group, only 13% said uh, it's flawed measurements, global warming's not occurring. So only 13%, which kind of overlays with our, our skeptic population, 17% uh, percent we're not sure how to, uh, to respond uh, to that. A couple of more questions before I, before I wrap. Um, this is, I'm really fascinated, uh, done work in the past with Barry and Eric and, and really interested in the, the dominant approaches, right? How do we look at approaching climate change at this point? And this to me is, is kind of the fascinating nexus where we are in, in the policy debates. You know, mitigation certainly remains an important topic uh, discussed at all levels. Adaptation is quickly rising uh, in, in many areas given the realities of our inability to mitigate. Uh, and also discussion of engineering, geoengineering options. And we've really hit this hard in recent iterations of the survey about the possibility of geoengineering, so sequestration of, of carbon, uh, atmospheric uh, um, uh, engineering, if you will, those types of things. And so we kind of framed it here in this question is, which do you believe is the most important approach to take? And about 40%, the plurality say it's, it's most important to try and reduce climate change. Uh, about 16% said learn to adapt. Um, this is kind of the accepting, okay, I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything about it. It's, it's really fascinating when you overlay this with beliefs, by the way. It'll be, I wish I had more time uh, to do that. Uh, about 17%, and this is interesting, promote the biggest thing we could be doing is promote geoengineering, scientific fixes uh, in there. And we ask a lot of more specific questions and the rest all equally. So to me, this, this relationship, right? Is it a complementary uh, policy approach where all hands on deck, mitigation, uh, adaptation and geoengineering or one substituting for the other, right? Plan B, okay, we can't mitigate, we're not doing it. Should we invest in these other options? So it's, it's to me a, a really rich area to look at. Uh, finally, carbon tax question. We've looked at carbon taxes for years, as Eric noted uh, in the Canadian example, uh, in the United States, we've asked this question and this is from our latest iteration. And you could see uh, pretty close to what Eric found on the overall numbers, Canada a little higher as it often is in support. Uh, but you do see 40% uh, of the overall population uh, that we looked at support a carbon tax. That's, that's fairly uh, normal in our numbers um, and we could frame it in different ways. You see uh, slightly more opposed, the rest neutral, uh, but those partisan divides that I could have layered into almost any of the questions I showed today uh, uh, highly on display, right? A majority of America, uh, Democrats support, uh, only 12% of Republicans support. And as you try to move carbon tax legislation uh, and get the support of, of at least a significant uh, portion of Republicans, that becomes 
challenging. Uh, so with that, I think we are probably uh, uh, at our time and we could talk maybe in the question and answer about some comparative perspectives, but I wanna make sure we have time to move on to, to Mexico um, at this point. Hey, thank you so much to you both. It's always so interesting to get each of your perspectives, particularly given the longitudinal nature of your work and the ability to look at these trends and patterns through the same survey over a period of time, much less begin to bring them together. I just wanted to ask one initial question and then hand things back to, to Josh. And that is, um, you know, Eric, you and I have had this conversation for a long time about differences and the challenges of meshing any Canadian and American climate policy because of political differences, including the parties that occupy the heads of state role. And yet it would seem, given the developments of the last, literally the last few weeks, including the initial Zoom US-Canadian summit, that there might be a level of alignment. And yet when one looks at the policy outcomes, right now, fundamental differences. Canada is on a march first to a $50 a ton carbon price and perhaps well into triple digits. The US remains lodged at zero and may well remain at zero in terms of carbon price and on. And so my question to either of you, if you'd like to comment on this, drawing on your public opinion work or thinking about overlap between public opinion and politics, should we see this as a moment where the stars could align and we could see these two massive neighbors, huge economies, fossil fuel dependence, really begin to coordinate and develop similar kinds of policies or are the fragments and the differences and even some of the opinion variation that you see just too great to expect that? Any initial thoughts on that drawing on the entirety of your, your work in this field? It's a great question. I'll let Eric lead off. Uh, I think here in the kind of Canadian perspective is, is, is fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Barry. That's a great question. I think it, there are two, I think I can answer both ways. I mean, on the one hand, I, I'm tempted to say, um, no, because uh, just on the coordination, I mean, I think the Canadian federal government has a hard enough time coordinating across provinces, uh, let alone uh, cross nationally with the United States. At the same time, we've seen instances where the Canadian, Canadian governments have imported policies from the United States, whether it be California emission standards, or, or the like, we've had conservative governments explicitly say we're tying our policy approach to what happens in the United States, given uh, NAFTA considerations, free trade considerations, and, and competitive, competitiveness concerns. So I do think that uh, this, this conversation of coordination cross-nationally won't necessarily be a binational conversation. It could potentially be one where Joe Biden starts thinking about border carbon tax uh, adjustments, and then inevitably Canada and Mexico would probably be brought uh, online. But um, again, I, I mean, in, in terms of a coordinated carbon tax, I'm highly skeptical, uh, but I do think that there are particular policies um, that, that could spill over into Canada as has been uh, in the past. Yeah. I'll just re really quickly uh, 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 agree with what, what Eric said. And I'm, you know, very, we, we those cross national work between the two, I, I've been more impressed and you've written about this extensively, the things that Eric talked about, the, the more subnational relationships between states and provinces and those types of things as being the, the door, I won't say back door to, to, to this, but the kind of on the, on the national levels, I think the, the hurdles remain Herculean. Um, but things as the last point that Eric mentioned, you know, about, but maybe, uh, you know, thinking about border taxes as a way to open options uh, for the Biden administration as they look at ways to, to possibly broach a carbon tax, um, some form of carbon tax, seems to me to at least have a possibility because it might be seen as, as some ways indirect cost. We know that from the research, lots of greater support for those types of, of avenues compared to more traditional, you know, gas taxes or anything else like that. So um, still a, a reach, uh, but, but certainly I think some of the underlying factors that we saw today opened the door for that to be more considered. Maybe we could talk about that in the question and answer. Thank you both. Josh. 
Great, thank you, thank you both. That was really informative. Um, at this time, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who will talk about Mexico. But before I do, a reminder to the audience that you can use the Q&A button on the bottom of your uh, Zoom control panel to ask a question of any of the panelists in writing. Uh, if you would like to direct it to a particular panelist, please just state whom. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce It's Whiteley Zamora Sainz, who is a researcher at the Dominguez Belisario Institute of the Senate of Mexico in the area of public opinion in parliamentary work. He holds a doctorate in sociology from the Latin American Faculty of the Social Sciences, also known as FLASCO, uh, and he held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute for Social Research at UNAM, which is of course our Mexican partner for the colloquium series. It's Whiteley has taught at both UNAM and the Mora Institute and is currently part of the national system of research in Mexico. It's Whiteley. And please unmute your, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, looks good. Okay, perfect. Good morning to everyone. First of all, thank you very much to Joshua Basesis for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I also want to thank Jessica Olmos and Jennifer Lopez for their support of the research. I hope that the information I will present today will be useful to you in gaining sense of Mexican public opinion about renewable energy. And let me tell you that in the Belisario Institute, uh, just uh, realized one national survey every year, and it's more focused about uh, political subjects of the Congress. So when we are uh, making a research about other topic, other item, we choose and systematize other national surveys available. And that's uh, the way I'm going to, to follow in my presentation. At the end, uh, I have a, a link uh, where you can download the full document and you can see the sources and the methodology, the, the methodology of all of the stories. Okay, the first section of my presentation uh, concerns uh, the current political context of Mexico, as the energy, uh, the energy issue has been very important to the government. Uh, precisely, one of the core policies of President López Obrador is to restore energy sovereignty. Therefore, Important efforts have been made to strengthen state-owned companies, such as the Petroleum Company, better known as Pemex, and the Federal Electricity Commission. In this regard, President has made two major decisions. To give fiscal support to Pemex to continue its, its investment in oil exploration and extraction, and to prioritize electricity generation through the energy produced by the Federal Electricity Commission first with idle power and then with gas and oil-based plants. This second action was promoted with the Electric, the Electric Industry Act passed by the Congress on the first week of March. At this time, the implementation of this law has been halted until a political and legal process determines its legality. All right, let, now let's look at public opinion indicators with particular interest in what people know about it their assessment are, uh, around environmental effects and how they pri prioritize the energy issue in terms of the policies. In, in this graph, uh, you can see uh, that there is some knowledge uh, on the part of the Mexican population about our country energy metrics. Two of the three most important important energy sources such as petroleum and hydroelectric are clearly identified. However, the, there is an overvaluation of solar energy and the contrary, little knowledge about the role of gas. The share of gas in our country energy metrics is very significant and has increased in recent years, a situation that seems to have gone unnoticed by the public. In turn, solar energy is not yet sufficiently harnessed in Mexico. In this indicator, the people survive probably respond more in terms of the potential of solar energy than in its current role in the energy matrix. In the next graph, 
Uh, renewable energy is a topic of interest to Mexicans. According to the National Environmental Survey carried out by the most highly regarded public university in Mexico, approximately 95% of respondents claim to have an interest in these energy sources. However, there is another gap on the part of the population in terms of precise information. As can be seen in graph two, the two options most frequently mentioned, petroleum and natural gas, are misidentified as renewable energies since both are fossil fuels. The same situation happens with diesel and coal options. The renewable energy with a higher level of knowledge is the wind power, followed by wood, and renewable energy with a lower degree of knowledge is geothermal energy. A reasonable conjuncture can be made regarding of the Mexican public's concerns about the environmental effect of fossil fuels. Two different surveys demonstrate some consistency on this issue. In the National Environmental Survey, nine of 10 respondents claim that they are, very, they are very concerned about the environmental effect of gas, oil, and coal. Uh, you can see this data in graph three, that 53% uh, respond that much and 33 that something. On the other hand, in this uh, figure number one, we show some interesting data from the National Survey of Energy Consumption in Private Homes carried out by the institution responsible of the official statistics in Mexico. You can see how there is a higher level of understanding about the environmental damage caused by the use of certain energy, particularly, particularly gasoline in vehicles. 77, one point percent note that there, is, there is, uh, that there is a lot of impact of the environment. Um, environmental damage from firewood and coal uh, is also widely recognized. However, it is noteworthy that people do not recognize the environmental effects of natural gas at the same scale as we saw the, they did for gasoline, firewood and coal. It can be seen that people who identify some type of involvement for cylinder or stationary gas were less than half of the population survey, while for natural or pipe gas it was 31.1%. I put a, a, a picture because maybe in the United States and Canada are not familiar with the cylinder gas that is in the container we use in, at homes to, to store the, the gas. It could be conjectured that the low level of recognition of the environmental damage caused by gas is due to the communication shortage about natural gas compared to car pollution. It is possible that people are familiar with their use of gas in the home, but they do not the whole process and environmental effects behind its extraction. In this um, graph number four, uh, we show the perception of Mexicans regarding the future of energy sources. It identifies great optimism that in the medium terms, and it means 15 years, there will be a greater capacity to take advantage of renewable sources to a wind and solar to generate electricity in the house. There is also a majority of the survey population that is confident that the people will improve certain habits related to the use of fossil fuels such as gas and petroleum derivatives, as well as in the use of electricity. Public opinion was divided on the future availability of gas and gasoline, as 44.4% respond that they will be deployed in 15 years, while 42.5% say that will, be not, will, will not be the case. Finally, a negative perception prevailed about the possibility that gas and gasoline could improve to reduce the environmental, their environmental impact. In the chart, uh, number one shows a comparison of three surveys that allow us to identify the place of climate change and energy on the citizen agenda of priority problems to be solved with better laws or with, develop, uh, with the development of science and technology. I highlight climate change in the table because one of the most intentionally recognized, internationally recognized policies for its mitigation is precisely the development of renewable energies. In the 2019 National Survey of the Senate, 
people place climate change in seventh place among environmental issues that need to be addressed with more comprehensive and stricter laws with 24% of the mentions. Although percentage-wise, it is far from the first two places, it's significant that air pollution, effect of the fuel and fossil fuel use, take first place and the deforestation, cause of climate change, that uh, takes second. In the story of the city's science and technology agenda for 2018, climate change ranked third, while energy ranked fourth. For its part, the National Science of Technology survey climate change ranks fourth as a problem that science should have, should have to solve over the next five years, while energy ranks seventh on the list. Finally, another uh, very important topic that informs public opinion on energy in Mexico is related to one of the strategic projects of President uh, López Obrador. That is the construction of the Dos Bocas refinery in Tabasco. The construction of this infrastructure work is part of the, uh, of the Obrador administration actions to restore energy sovereignty. As you can see, in the, in the next graph, in the graph number five, uh, this action is recognized for more than the half of the population. Graph, uh, graph six shows that this project is considered to be the second most important only behind the construction of the new international airport. In these, uh, the last two, two graphs, uh, not only uh, do, do people know about the project and recognize how important it is to the, to the government, but there is also significant social support for it. Graph number seven show how, uh, that the 67% uh, of Mexicans agree, agree with the construction of the refinery. Only two of 10 people claim to disagree. Finally, graph eight shows that benefits are most recognized for different sectors. There are thought to be practically, practically the same level of benefits to the state of Tabasco, where the refinery is being built, as to the country as whole. 56% of people, regardless of their economic status of if they have a car, feel they will have benefit from this project. It will, be, it will have been interesting to include among the answers the benefit to the environment to see what the population were responding to. Uh, with this view of the, of the refinery, it seems to me that we have enough information to say that despite the interest of, in alternative energy sources, oil and its derivatives are regarded by the Mexican population as fundamental elements in designing economic development policies as it was in the 1950s and the 1960s. This longing for the welfare state of that time allows to understand to some extent the social support that the energy policy of the current government has. With this idea, I'm done and um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, it's widely. It was really great to be able to have uh, some information from all three countries in this um, event. So we really appreciate your uh, presentation. Um, at this point, uh, we have time for a couple questions. Um, so I'm going to lead with a question from uh, uh, Caitlin Ramey, who's on the faculty here at the Ford School. And um, she, she has a question about the slide that Eric showed tying uh, polarization to self-reported familiarity, um, wondering if perhaps um, there could be a different causal direction um, and, and noting that her work shows that people who feel superior about their own views then tend to overestimate their knowledge and engage in selective seeking out of news sources. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I don't know if I inferred causality, I guess I was speculating a bit. Um, I think both are plausible um, explanations for that uh, interactive relationship. Um, uh, I think though an important point in, I don't know if it's worth me putting it back up that slide, but uh, an important point I think is um, uh, that the Conservative uh, Party of Canada supporters and the Liberal Party of Canada supporters are exposed uh, to different kinds of information. 
Um, and I think that's really uh, important to, to consider. Now, whether or not that is causing them to support the carbon tax or whether or not it's their kind of pre-existing, uh, I guess, belief superiority or partisan identification or partisan predispositions, I think is an open question. And I don't have um, uh, any kind of data or experiments done to kind of tease that out, the arrow of causality, but I think it's a very important point uh, to raise that it might not necessarily be uh, information randomly <laughs> kind of transmitted to these individuals that's making them, uh, it's probably, there's probably some self-selection going on here with uh, partisans uh, looking at different types of information depending on, you know, who they follow on Twitter or who their, what their networks are on, on, on Facebook and that sort of a thing. Thanks for the question. Great. Did Chris was, did you have anything to add or is that pretty much, are you good? Okay. Thumbs up. All right. So the next question um, deals with uh, carbon taxes um, and it's uh, asked by um, Newt Nadelhofer and he's differentiating between a uh, carbon tax generally and a carbon fee and dividend uh, plan um, with, with uh, which is a, a, a apparently what citizens climate lobby and the climate leadership council are proposing. Um, do you have any, did you ask about that level of distinction or do you have any insights about how the public might feel about that distinction? Yeah, Josh and, and Newt's point is, is very important. Framing of carbon tax and the use of dividends has significant impact on public support. We've tested this in various forms, various frames over various iterations. Um, and it found um, important differences. It matters, right? So for example, and we didn't do it in this particular way. We just asked the, the kind of neutral uh, uh, framing that I presented and that Eric ran in Canada at the same time. But we have including kind of matched uh, Eric over time uh, test on dividend use. Um, the most popular dividend use by far, which raises overall public support uh, are, are two things transferring any dividends uh, to renewable energy use and development. That score is consistently popular, uh, dramatically raises support for the mechanism as a whole. Uh, the other is in some type of revenue neutral uh, return to citizens, basically using that money that's generated in some kind of offset for something like in income tax. Uh, other uh, affixed uh, sources or uh, destinations for the revenue don't po pose uh, as great success. We uh, tested things like debt over time, using it to pay down debt or deficits. Uh, and it, it actually, in some cases, reduces support levels from the neutral framing. So not all things are looked at, but certainly connections to, to renewable energy and certainly connections uh, to some type of uh, tax offset for other taxes scores very, very well. So it, it's important. Uh, and, and unfortunately, in this particular iteration, we didn't do any of those tests. I have more time series available if, if you'd like to see them. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, the Q&A is still open if anyone would like to submit additional questions. But I guess I'll ask a question in the meantime, which is, um, you know, it seems as though, uh, obviously, the, you know, the data that it's Watley presented was not exactly comparable with the data that Chris and Eric did, but nevertheless, there seems to be a clinging on to more traditional sources of energy in Mexico, oil, gas, a sort of, um, there seems to be more of a meeting of the minds as, as Barry alluded to in his question between Canada and the US, um, despite some um, differences as well. Um, so this is a question I'd be curious, it's Watley's uh, perspective, but also Chris and Eric, if you have anything to add, you know, one major difference, of course, you know, is just in terms of the resources that Canada is already so reliant on hydro and nuclear, which are non-emitting sources. Um, to what do you attribute sort of the distinction between Mexico and how the other two are seeing renewable energy? Do you think it's because of uh, more like government factors like the Obrador administration and his policies or more about just the resources that are available in each country? It, maybe with, uh, with the answer, I can touch a little bit the question of Barry Rafe no? about the, the, coordinate, the regional coordination, the, possi the possibility of that. And I think that in Mexico, the, uh, 
the, the population ha, uh, have an extra, uh, strong idea of, the, of that the petroleum is uh, very important for the economic development. And this is the, the, the narrative and the, the political discourse that we have uh, heard in the last 50 years. Petroleum and the oil is ours and is to improve the quality of, of life, you know, of fall of the Mexicans. So with, in the last administration, we, we shift a little bit about uh, to change the, the energetic matrix to improve the renewable energies, you know, to open the energy to the private investment. And with uh, the political change, uh, the, dis the, the discourse of, pres of the president Lopez Obrador was the, that in first, in, in first place, that all the, the, this uh, private investment was part of the big, the big corruption that has Mexico. So uh, we cannot, uh, we must stop that opening because it's just corruption. And it was, cor and in the second place, this uh, shift of the last administration was just to sell and uh, to destroy the, the Mexican uh, state-owned companies of the electricity and, and petroleum uh, because of the neoliberalism. They try to destroy all the state-owned companies and the, it's like, like the, to recover the golden age of Mexico in petroleum and oil. The golden age of 50s, 60s, but now it's the, ten, the time is changing. And I think that the, the, the president is moving um, to another complete uh, direction about uh, in comparing with Biden and maybe with Canada. So uh, maybe that's, uh, that will be a, a very uh, problem or a, 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 a potential conflict with a regional agenda to coordinate and to decarbonize the, the economy because we are moving forward to another completely direction uh, because of do to, that's, uh, that two main ideas that I, I, I told you, know, the private investment is corruption and we need to return to the golden age of the welfare state that we uh, improve, that improves the, the quality of the life of, of Mexicans. So um, is, uh, is part of a, a, a political point of view and, and, and a narrative, and they are trying to, to recover, to to uh, to act to actualize to this administration, and is uh, potentially, in, I, I insist, uh, 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 a problem to the uh, a regional coordination with the other two countries. And maybe a problem with the TMEC, with the NAFTA, because we have agreement about in, in renewable energy. So I don't know what is going to happen with that with that point. Great. Well, yeah, there's a lot there, and you know, obviously, another indicator that would be interesting because it seems kind of implicit is trust in government, right? The, the government versus the private sector, and and uh, who you trust more to not be corrupt. Um, so we have one last question that's directed towards Chris and Eric both. Um, it's asked by uh, Heather Millar from the University of New Brunswick, who will be a future participant in our colloquium series, uh, wondering if Chris could say more about the relationship between beliefs and support for adaptation, and if Eric could comment on support for nuclear and whether it's driven more by partisanship, by partisanship or regionally. Oh, it's a great question. Heather, and I look forward to hearing Heather's, uh, Heather's talk. Um, yeah, we, we've broken it out. So there's different, you know, tests that we could use about adaptation, playing it in a kind of a zero sum game where people have to pick the most important adaptation versus mitigation versus geoengineering, or just more neutrally framed perspectives on adaptation. So there's different ways we can kind of look at underlying beliefs. One notable thing from our early cuts on the 2021 data uh, and overlaid with some previous studies is that 
that group that we talked about, the I, they think there's evidence of climate change, but attribute it largely to natural cycles um, are very much when you kind of pose it in a zero sum game, more likely uh, than those that accept uh, and more likely than those who deny climate change to uh, support adaptation as their choice on that list. And again, I, I bring up the slide. I wish I could do that without probably confuse people by the way I said it, but it's really interesting, right? Because and and it makes intuitive sense. I think back to Heather's question is they don't think it's happening because of anthropogenic factors, but it's happening. So how do you deal with it? Mitigation declines relatively to adaptation measures. Uh, and geoengineering, I think also relatively declines because geoengineering is seen if this is a natural cycle, can you really change it uh, as opposed to countering human induced factor. So it's a really fascinating relationship. Lots more there. Uh, Heather, I'm sorry if I didn't lay it out as good, well as it may be, but I'll turn it to Eric at this time. Who will improve? I doubt it, but I'll try. Um, <clears throat> on the nuclear question, I, I you're kind of anticipated. I ran out of steam or time, probably combination of the two. Uh, and I wanted to run some kind of analyses on, on the nuclear question over and above kind of like the bivariate analyses that I kind of presented. And so I didn't quite get to, uh, I was really close to answering your question, Heather, and I'm, I really regret it now, but um, because you, you asked a question I wasn't prepared for, but I can tell you, I did nevertheless look at those bivariate relationships. And so while not controlling for partisanship, looking at regionalism is where you find the, the largest differences. Um, so in particular, I mentioned Alberta, 70% support for nuclear energy in Alberta relative to Quebec, 24% support for nuclear energy. And those differences are just huge. Now, uh, to the extent that um, partisanship is important here, I'd, I'd really like to compare how partisanship plays out in those two areas to see if that kind of mitigates uh, these regional differences. But if I, if I had to bet right now, I, I'd say region might trump partisan uh, right you know, as of now, but I will double check and I promise to get back to you on that. Great, thank you so much, Eric. And uh, that's all the time we have. Thanks to those of you who stuck not only towards the bitter end, but 15 minutes over. I think it's really a testament to uh, how fascinating uh, the presentations were. And um, we hope you'll join us for our next NAC webinar event on April 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, Barry and I would like to thank you all again, both the audience and the panelists. Have a good afternoon. Take care.